welcome to another episode of Curious Minds. All you curious people chiming in to see what I have to say today. Well, it is scripted. It's been scripted for a little while. It's part of the series on critical thinking. I'm Evan Vansicle. This is Curious Minds, where I want to encourage you to think well about the things that matter most. This is a Christian apologetics program, which means I give good reasons for the Christian faith and defend it against attacks coming from things like atheism, primarily, secular humanism, Islam, Buddhism, New Age movement, witchcraft, apathy, I think is nasty these days. Even elements of Roman Catholicism appear anti-Christian, so I want to give reasons for the Christian faith, and sometimes that means exposing false alternatives which only serve as a way to distract and deter people away from the truth. I believe that when we live in the truth, we are living right. Uh, Rather than living according to convenient lies, if we live according to the truth, things will turn out just fine so long as we yield to the truth at hand which, I believe, ought to challenge people toward acknowledging the existence of God, the validity of Jesus' resurrection, and the message as taught by Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead. Now, it is midsummer now here in Albuquerque, which means it's kind of warm outside. So people doing a little bit less outside, it seems. I think people are content staying in their air-conditioned buildings, at least till the sun goes down, then it gets a little nicer. But I'm told this is fairly normal, if not a little below normal for temperatures. So, checking the weather now, we're sitting at 98 degrees, which, incidentally, is a ban from my childhood. Like I said, this is the middle part of a series on critical thinking. We've talked about listening. And now applying that listening, we're going to do so through critical thinking, which means we're going to test worldviews. How are we going to test them, you ask? Well, one way that we're going to test them is according to their livability and self-consistency. Can you live according to the things that you claim are true, ultimate truths? Can that perspective be consistent with itself? And this is based on the premise that if you are forced to live inconsistently with what you claim to be true, you need to either change the way you live, or if that's not doable, then you need to change the worldview. And I believe this is a powerful way to test what is true, and it's something that we should see, at least in next week's episode, how Christianity fulfills this requirement. In part one of this critical thinking series, I encouraged you to not only listen well, but to think and respond well. A truly Christian witness should strive to avoid some of the temptations of dialoguing through disagreements. The main one we looked at was the straw man fallacy, which is the tactic of misrepresenting the other person's position in order to make it easier to disprove or to simply make it look worse than it is. There is a fine line between accurately summarizing a position and manipulating a position. We can't expect perfection, but I think that we will be better by focusing on being accurate and gracious toward other people's claims. You may find this part a little bit easier. We're still wanting to listen well and represent the other side accurately. One of the key aspects of thinking well through their claims is to apply these two questions. Can their position be lived out? Is the position consistent with itself? Can it be lived out? To put it another way, when the claim is put against the way you have been living your life, does it make sense of this or not? If you were to consistently live as though the claim were true, would you be disgusted with the product? Does it demand a great deal of cognitive dissonance? That is, thinking one thing but behaving in a totally different way. Let's look at some examples, starting with the more lighthearted examples, and we'll merge into some intense examples. 
A psychoanalyst and apparently self-proclaimed philosopher Sigmund Freud said, quote, Love is a state of temporary psychosis, end quote. Strangely enough, 361 people hit the love button in support of this quote. Hmm, are they being psychotic in doing so? To avoid psychosis, Freud apparently suggests avoiding love. But who can go a day without loving something, especially themselves? People are bound to pour their attention, emotion, resources, and devotion into something. So I would wager that it's impossible not to be struck with love. If Freud is talking about a more specific type of love, it still seems unlivable because the perpetuation of the human species, according to his theory, depends on this sense of love. Here's another example. Consider the key aspect of the existential philosophy of Jean-Paul Sartre. Quote, Man is condemned to be free, because once thrown into the world, he is responsible for everything he does. End quote. Is this livable? Man is free. That seems to match what everyone observes in his way of behaving. Man is responsible for everything he does. That also seems to be livable and matches how he lives. I would say there's no problem here. What about Albert Camus? Camus has contributed to this evaluation of livable ideas. He said, quote, Basically, at the bottom of life, which seduces all of us, there is only absurdity, and more absurdity. The only thing that can defeat absurdity is lucidity. This is why he also said, quote, Life is meaningless, but worth living, provided you recognize its meaninglessness, end quote. This is not livable, partly because the statement itself is assumed to have great meaning. No one lives as though his statements and all his life choices and actions are absurd, lucid, or meaningless. To develop such a theory is to prove that you don't really believe it in such a way as to act on it. Here's another one from Friedrich Nietzsche, one of the most adamant and consistent atheists. He was a precursor to postmodern ideas and probably a precursor to new atheism. Nietzsche said, quote, You have your way. I have my way. As for the right way, the correct way, and the only way, it does not exist. He also said, quote, there are no facts, only interpretations, end quote. Any theory that rejects right and wrong, true and false, is probably going to be unlivable because they are promoting a universally applicable statement, and they assume that their statement rightly applies to all people. One cannot live consistently with the idea that different people have different truths, and there's no objective, capital T, truth. Lest you think I just attack the non-religious, there are some theological positions that lack livability. Christian science, which derived many of its ideas from 1st and 2nd century Gnosticism, believes that all evil and illness are illusions. If you free yourself from the shackles of believing in physical reality, you will eliminate sickness and so-called evil from your presence. Mary Baker Eddy, founder of Christian Science, who considered herself an author who met or exceeded the truth and applicability of the Bible, could not escape an ugly illness and death. Yeah, she pretty much went insane. Also, didn't she physically write some books? Uh, yeah, yeah she did. She could not live with what she claimed to be ultimate truth. Free will is an illusion! This idea plays out in a few different ways. One branch would be materialistic determinism. The other would be theological. In materialistic determinism, physical laws create a set of chain reactions that have been put in place from the beginning. There is no interference in this chain of reactions. This includes every thought you or I think and every action we, quote, chose to perform. In theological determinism, God's sovereignty is viewed as the eternal determining factor that fashions everything that has ever and will ever happen. 
Anything that you or I choose to do is actually directly determined according to the plan that God set in place from the beginning. As intriguing of a discussion as this can create, the position is unlivable. How about pantheism? Pantheism also seems unlivable. Pantheism states that God and the whole makeup of the universe are one and the same. But if God is good, and all is God, then all is good. Got it? This would imply that bad does not exist. Other forms of pantheism, like Taoism, Zoroastrianism, suggest that the universe is in a constant balance of good and evil, light and dark. This would suggest that good actions do not actually contribute to the overall good of the world. I would also argue that they cannot determine, distinguish the difference between good and evil. This, too, is unlivable. So, a proper theology or philosophy needs to be livable if it's going to be a viable option for thinking people. There is another related way to evaluate the quality of a claim or belief. This second part deals with asking whether the theory itself stands up to its own standards. Is it self-consistent, or does it play out differently from its claims? At its worst, this flaw will result in a self-defeating statement. A self-defeating statement contradicts itself, but there are also softer versions that aren't necessarily contradictory, but are inconsistent. Let's look at a couple hypothetical self-defeating statements. I can't speak a word of English. I don't know anything. Do you know that? I can't think. The statement, I can't think, requires thought. Don't listen to anybody's advice. Should I take your advice on that? People can't tell anybody what to do. Are you telling me what to do right now? It's impossible to know truth. Liar. You're claiming to know truth. Everybody has the right to make up their mind for themselves. Sorry, my mind's not made up on that. Nobody's opinion is better than anybody else's. Well, then my opinion of the contrary is equal. Again, these are self-defeating statements. They are internal contradictions, so they cannot possibly be true. Similar statements are inconsistent with themselves, or inconsistent with life in general. Let's see some examples from real life, and bear in mind that such statements are often considered brilliant by those who do not know that they need to be looking for internal consistency. Here's Nietzsche again. You have your way, I have my way. As for the right way, the correct way, and the only way, it does not exist. Nietzsche seems to be suggesting that the right thing to do is to deny that there is a right thing to do. It is inconsistent with itself. Sigmund Freud had something quite different from postmodernism to say about the meaning of words. Quote, words can transfer knowledge from teacher to student. Words enable the orator to sway his audience and dictate its decisions. Words are capable of arousing the strongest emotions and prompting all men's actions. End quote. What do you make of this? Consistent or not? This is actually an example of internal consistency. His statement on words is almost exactly the same way he uses them in the sentence. Freud also said, quote, Knowledge is the intellectual manipulation of carefully verified observations. I had to look twice at this one. This statement must be some sort of intellectual manipulation, otherwise it's not knowledge at all. It's not quite self-contradictory, but it doesn't appear to be consistent with itself. Listen to it again. Knowledge is the intellectual manipulation of carefully verified observations. Here's another one from Freud. Quote, humanity is in the highest degree irrational, so that there is no prospect of influencing it by reasonable arguments. So, I guess he is being irrational here? 
Why is he reasoning with people by saying this? I don't mean to pick on Freud. He actually said some very interesting and consistent things, but I also believe that Freud was inconsistent in applying psychoanalysis to other people while failing to apply the same level of analysis to himself. This is a problem for the famous new atheist Richard Dawkins. Dawkins said, We are machines built by DNA whose purpose is to make more copies of the same DNA. This is exactly what we are for. We are machines for propagating DNA. And the propagation of DNA is a self-sustaining process. It is every living object's sole reason for living. End quote. So, DNA, why does he intend on educating us? Why does he act as though certain things are better to believe than others if our purpose is reproducing our DNA? This is not consistent with the meaning of purpose. It is not very livable, and it is not consistent with itself. This inconsistency gets more blatant when Dawkins says, We are survival machines. Robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. This is a truth which still fills me with astonishment. End quote. Clearly, Dawkins is trying to do more than survive and pass along his DNA. He would not research and write such things unless this were the case. He's saying this as though he is not simply a conglomerate of genetics spouting selfishness and survival. He is actually living as if he is a free being, consisting of meaning, truth, and the human condition. Let's get Richard Rorty in on the party. He was a 20th century analytic, pragmatic philosopher. He said, quote, The world is out there, but descriptions of the world are not. End quote. Sir, that sounds like a description that applies to the world. Hence, it is self-defeating. It is completely inconsistent with itself. No descriptions of the world, claimed Rorty. Hmm. Let's revisit the Hitchens-Lennox debate. Something we looked at last week. Lennox asked Hitchens... By the way, uh, Lennox, a Christian philosopher, Hitchens, who has passed away a few years ago. He is atheistic philosopher, debater, author, speaker. So Lennox asked Hitchens about the meaning and purpose in life. His brief answer was, Why do I care? Not just about myself, but about others? Well, if I didn't, I wouldn't belong to a species that would have gotten this far. He essentially said evolution filtered out species that did not have these feelings of morality, affection, and protection for one another, while preserving a species that did sense these traits. Okay, there are a few logical problems with this, but we're focusing on consistency versus inconsistency. Hitchens gave an explanation for why it might have gotten here, but it doesn't explain why he or anyone would choose to live by these moral intuitions. This type of so-called moral development would be just as effective in a creature with no free will and no awareness of its behavior. It doesn't explain enough, and what it does explain is inconsistent with the way that he, or any of us, experience life. Like with the question of whether a view is livable, theological ideas can be tested according to their internal consistency. If a view about God or the ultimate meaning of the universe crumbles under its own scrutiny, then we can safely put it in the category of false, at least as it's currently formulated. Here's some perspectives on God. A certain branch of agnosticism, called strong agnosticism, agnostics say that they do not know whether there is a God. Strong agnosticism says that one cannot know whether God exists because God is unknowable. Some people may say, we cannot know anything about God. The problem is, this is a significant, meaningful statement about the nature of God. If we cannot know anything about God, then we could not identify God as an unknowable being. There would simply be no meaningful statements about God, yet no statements that there are no meaningful statements about God. 
As soon as it becomes discovered and is made into a statement, it does not withstand its own scrutiny, meaning it cannot be true. Well, I'm going to risk offending some Christians on this one, but hear me out. The Bible contains everything you need to know. This has a nice reverential sentiment, so it's all too easily adopted by Christians, probably well-meaning Christians at that. What's the problem? If the Bible contains everything I need to know, then I don't need to know that. For the claim itself is not in the Bible. Sorry. Okay. Offense episode of Christians is over. Pantheism says, You are God. I am God. All is God. This is typically communicated to a Christian or someone who disagrees with pantheism. But if all is God, why would God say to God that he is God? If the person really is God in nature, then whatever he is thinking and however he is behaving is an expression of godness. Why would a consistent pantheist want to convince a non-pantheist that he is wrong? Isn't it because his apparent wrongness is evidence that not all is God? There's a separation between God and what we know of ourselves. After listening and alongside our listening, we will want to develop skills in critical thinking. This not only helps your skill in apologetics, but it helps you and I develop accurate theological perspectives. In other words, critical thinking helps us know God better. An important part of critical thinking is consistency. Can a person live consistently with the claim that they are making? If not, it is weak and the philosophy behind it is not worth pursuing. Also, figure out whether an idea is consistent with itself. If it does not stand up to its own standards, if it is self-defeating, or if it requires things to be entirely different from the way we experience them, then this is also a sign of philosophical weakness. Ideas like this should be exposed for what they are and rejected or corrected. Next time, we will continue into part three of this critical thinking series. We will apply critical thinking tests and strategies to a Christian worldview. This will help us test its credibility and formulate significant things in consistent ways. Join me next time for that part three of this critical thinking series. This is Evan Van Sickle on the Curious Minds podcast at the Christian Student Center across the street from the University of New Mexico. Come say hi to me sometime. Come let your theological and philosophical thoughts be known. Write me an email. Come see me in person. Let's talk. Let's think well about the things that matter most. Until next week. God bless and guide you.